this time we have a quorum. Let's get started. First decoration, okay? Please. Ellen. Um, Mr. Chairman, I'm a member of the Housing Authority. Uh, I uh, was just, I was a Housing Authority member that just stepped down. Um, I'm also a member of the Housing Authority. Okay, thank you for the decoration. Now we could invite the witnesses in. Members, when you ask questions, Please uh, first refer to the paragraph number. It would be easier for the witnesses to follow which part of the report we're on. Thank you. Um, welcome, Secretary. Welcome, Secretary. I'm not going to introduce your team one by one. If you wish um, any of your colleagues to answer questions, please um, let us know. Okay, so you just direct uh, which of your colleagues will answer questions. Thank you. Welcome. Our lead member is Kenneth. Kenneth, you can start now. 15 minutes each. Uh, I will um, be straight with the time limit. Uh, if you have follow up questions, you uh, we'll have to wait for the second round. Yes, Kenneth. Oh, Secretary. My, oh, my apologies, Secretary. Yes, uh, you have opening remarks. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, the Housing Department is the executive arm of the Hong Kong Housing Authority, HA, and is tasked to implement the policies determined by the HA. The department is responsible for managing 730,000 public rental housing PRH youth flats. As at end June 2013, the waiting list WL, applicants include some 118,700 general applications, that is elderly and family applicants, and 115,600 non-elderly one-person applicants under the quota and points system QPS. I welcome the independent value for money study provided by the Director of Audit and his colleagues, which forms an important external audit mechanism on top of the internal auditing system of the Department. The report of the Director of Audit confirms that, in line with the policies set by the HA, the Department has taken a number of initiatives to maximize the rational utilization of PRH resources. With such a large-scale operation and service area, we recognize that there is always room for improvement in the day-to-day -day administration of public housing, including rationalizing working procedures and enhancing transparency. We will strive to ensure that public housing resources are best used and can meet the housing need of the eligible general public more efficiently. Our objective is to provide PRH to low-income families who cannot afford private rental accommodation, and our target is to maintain the average waiting time at around three years for general applicants on the WL. I must point out that the average waiting time for general applicants is calculated, one, on the average of the waiting time of general applicants housed to PRH over the past 12 months, and two, the waiting time counts from the date of registration to the date of the first offer of a PRH flat. Currently, applicants will have three housing offers to cater for their choices as far as practicable. In the past, we have mentioned repeatedly um, in the definition of the average waiting time and the basis of its calculation on numerous public occasions, including at meeting of the Legislative Council and to the press. However, in the view in view of the Director of all this recommendation, we agree that we can enhance the publicity in this respect, for example, on the website of the HA and include this in the application guidelines. 
For the enhancement of transparency in PRH application, we share the Director of Audit's view that there is a need to conduct investigations periodically to identify long outstanding cases on the WL. In fact, we have conducted analysis of the housing situation of WL applicants annually since 2011 to study, amongst other things, cases on the WL of longer waiting times. We recently reported the outcome of the 2013 analysis to the panel on housing of the Legislative Council at the panel meeting held on the 4th of November 2013. We plan to continue with the special analysis and report the same on an annual basis. During the application period, some applicants may have changes rendering their applications ineligible, for example, the household income and or asset of applicant exceeding the limits and thus have their applications cancelled until they fulfil the criteria again before reinstatement of the applications. This will result in the extension of the aggregate of waiting time. For such cases, we will consider providing illustration to ensure that concerned public applicants understand the circumstances. Given the limited public housing resources and the lengthening WL for PLH, we consider that priority in the allocation of PRX units should continue to be given to general applicants, including family and the elderly applicants, over non-elderly one-person applicants. Nevertheless, we fully understand that there have been calls from the community for the QPS to be refined. The Long-Term Housing Strategy LTHS consultation document published by the Steering Committee on LTHS has also put forward recommendations on the QPS, including allocating more points to those who are above the age of 45, developing a mechanism to regularly review the income and asset of QPS applicants, etc. The public consultation exercise will end on the 2nd of December 2013. We will pass the LTHS Steering Committee's recommendations. Any views from the public on this issue received during the public consultation exercise, as well as the Director of Audit's rec observations and recommendations to the HA for consideration and implementation where appropriate. At all times, we do our best. In view of the long WL and the increasing AWT for PRH in recent years, the Director of Audit considers that the HA needs to critically review the well of tenants' policies to see whether the various um, uh, to review the well of tenants' uh, policies. Um, there are actually divergent views on the welfare uh, well of tenants' policies in community. Some were of the opinion that the policy should be tightened, while some advocated for relaxation or even cancellation. The public consultation document. Uh, invites further view, public views on the policies which will facilitate HA to further consider the related issues and better utilize the public housing resources. The Department has put in place effective measures to detect tenancy abuse cases. In 2013-14, besides strengthening detective measures from frontline management staff, 30 extra experienced estate staff were deployed to the central team to step up action to tackle tenancy abuses and to conduct 5,000 additional checks of tenants' income assets declarations. Furthermore, the education and promotion programs to promote awareness of the need of proper use of public housing resources have been strengthened. Having considered the recommendations made by the Director of Audit on handling the under-occupation issue in 2006 7 the HA endorsed in 2007 various interim measures and established the prioritized UO PU threshold to deal with the UO cases in a phased approach. The Department reviewed the UO policy in 2010 and 2013 respectively to revise the PUO threshold to be achieve better results. Among the 54,555 outstanding U cases listed in the audit report, only um, the HA will continue its efforts to tackle this issue in a pragmatic, caring and considerate approach. Now, out of these um, 50,000 odd cases, only 1,765 are PUO cases. For the remaining cases which involve the elderly disabled households, and those not reaching the PO living density, the HA needs to tackle them with prudence. As I said earlier, I welcome the audit review on the allocation and utilization of PRH flats. I want to express my appreciation 
for the professional manner in which this exercise was conducted, in particular for the opportunity the department has been given to respond to some of the findings and to clarify many points ahead of the finalization of the report. We have generally accepted the recommendations and will take follow-up action and implement them accordingly. Where policy clearance is required, we would refer them to the HA or its committees for discussion and endorsement. We have prepared some supplementary information sheets and a checklist of cases identified with irregularities in the audit report to facilitate members uh, to understand more on the subjects covered. These have been circulated. Chairman, I, together with the Director of Housing and his colleagues, will be pleased to answer members' questions. As I have to leave at 10.30 um, to attend the um, discussion of an item on the panel of the um, com uh, panel on uh, commerce and economic development. So I will have to be absent for a short while after for that period. Now, this um, opening remarks. The number is R sixty one stroke three stroke Gen one. So, uh, Kenneth, you're the first. Fifteen minutes. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, thank you, Secretary, for your opening remarks. Uh, if I may first focus on Part 2. Members, please refer to Part 2. The uh, procedure in uh, dealing with uh, H House uh, PRH applications. Can I refer you all to page 30 and 31 of the audit report in the Chinese version? There are two tables there. The number of uh, cases, applications, um, that is um, accepted for registration, rejected. In the English version, it's page 35, actually, table 10. Now, rejected cases, there are quite a number of them each year. Does it mean that for these cases, the applicants would not be able to apply again, that means they are simply not eligible for PRH is that case. Perhaps I could defer to Mr. Albert Lee, to Deputy Director, or Mr. Agnes Wong, Deputy Director. Thank you. By rejected, that means that they do not meet the eligibility criteria. For example, their income or asset limit has exceeded our limit or there are other circumstances. But after the rejection, let's say a year later, the applicant becomes eligible again, he could join the queue um, afresh. But of course, it's a rejected case. The lot G number no longer exists. That means he has to start um, queuing afresh. Thank you. Now, what I'd like to point out is that um, in terms of uh, publicity, perhaps the uh, HA hasn't done enough. Now, in uh, dissemination of information, if you could do better, then what I see is that for these rejected cases, about 25 to 30 percent of these cases, they took up a lot of the manpower of the HA in dealing with these cases. But if uh, the public know exactly what the eligibility criteria are for PRH, then you could have saved a lot of resources. Now, if I may refer members to page 29 of the Chinese version, um, the uh, procedure of um, applying for PRH in 2.56, para 2.56, page 34 of the English version. Um, there are many different uh, declaration forms, 17 in total. They are not part of the application form. And then in 2.58 and 2.59, it's pointed out that many applicants have to revise their application forms. Table 11 page 37 of the English version, is uh, seen here. For many applicants, they have to resubmit their application. Some actually have to resubmit their forms four times before the applications are accepted by the housing department. And then in, uh, paragraph 2.8, the... Um, 2.80, oh, the um, Director of Audit has um, given some recommendation, that is, uh, whether the hard copies and um, whether you have um, got proper application forms, as um, actually said 2.79. So do you have a timetable for implementing these uh, recommendations? 
um, Ms. Wong. Yes, um, Mr. Leung mentioned there are 17 declaration forms. If you refer to Annex uh, E of the um, report, you'll see that it's not the case that uh, every form is uh, need required to be filled in by the applicant. Otherwise, the um, application form would be thick. But anyway, in the light of the Directive Order's recommendations, we will make an improvement. We will upload these forms in the website, and there will be also hard copies available at the Lokfu Center. And we'll also see if there's any room for improvement in the forms to so make it easier to follow for the applicants. Now, uh, just now it's been mentioned that uh, some applicants have to resubmit their application forms a number of times. Well, maybe in the uh, actually in the application forms we have stated clearly what information needs to be submitted, but sometimes the applicants simply do not provide uh, all the required information. That's why we have to ask them for the um, missing information, and that's why sometimes um, the applicants have to resubmit their forms a number of times. As for the declaration forms, we will make an effort to improve them. Thank you. Now, if you uh, if when you ask them to resubmit the application forms of the department, tell them over the phone or face to face, or would you explain to them what's uh, missing in their application? Now, what we do now is uh, when they first submit the application, uh, they should uh, attach uh, the required information. But perhaps at the first submission, the information is not complete. Then we will. Um, return the application form to the applicant, but there will be a letter to uh, tell them what information is missing or for what reasons we are returning the application. And we'll make improvements in the light of the Directive Order's recommendations now. That is um, for the th third time. For whatever reason, we kept telling them the first and second time that uh, they're still missing information. Still, they're missing information. That, uh, on the third occasion, we might call them and explain to them exactly what uh, is required, may just in case they don't quite fully follow. And hopefully, that will reduce the number of resubmissions. Kenneth? Now, after the application form is submitted, your performance pledge at 2.58. Para 2.58 is said that uh, um, within three months of receiving the application, you will inform the applicant writing whether uh, he could uh, be put on the waiting list and there will be an application number. Now, after the HD has accepted the applicant's application form and all the related um, docu documents, would you then do a vetting on the uh, um, um, uh, whether the, on whether the information is true. Now, 2.58 is about the preliminary, oh, I wouldn't call it a vetting, it's just to check whether the required information is complete. Um, for example, for income, there has to be an employment um, certificate, or if uh, the applicant has uh, children, perhaps the birth certificates of the children, or if it's a couple, the marriage certificate, and so on. So, um, on declaration of assets, well, yes, applicant has to declare assets too. But at this point, we are not going to conduct an in-depth investigation. In the first three, three months, what we want to ascertain is that the applicant um, meets the basic eligibility criteria, but the applicant has to sign a declaration that uh, the income and assets declared are true and correct. And um, maybe in about six months, uh, when we are able to make a housing offer, then we will do an in-depth investigation at that point. And we invite the applicant to come for an interview. We'll go through each of the income and asset item, and then we will do an uh, in-depth um, vetting at that stage. Now, we need to strike a balance. For every applicant, if uh, when he first uh, submits the application, we have to do the vetting ones, then it will actually delay the whole process. And sometimes in terms of income of asset, by asset that means that whether you hold any securities or funds, that's a part of the asset. Well, there may be changes to such items. So when we get to the stage when we are almost ready to make a housing offer and then we do an in-depth vetting, we believe that that uh, is a better balance uh, for both the applicant and our processing effort. Uh, of course, uh, when the applicant first submits the application, he is required to make a declaration. If he purposefully uh, makes false declaration at that point, uh, we have another team, the central team, to do the checking. If the 
declaration is uh, false on purpose, and if we find out, then we will take our prosecution. In the whole, in terms of the uh, whole process, how it could work um, properly, and in um, uh, preventing false declaration, we have to strike a balance. Thank you. Well, for the first round checking, that is the preliminary vetting, you said that uh, you check to see if all the papers are in order. Will your colleagues uh, look into the details contained in the information? You said you're not going to conduct an in-depth checking, but sometimes on the face of the information furnished, uh, you'll be able to see whether there is any inaccuracy. Did you do that? Uh, that is a basic checking, say, for example, for the income limit. The payroll has exceeded the limit, then that is obvious that uh, he's not eligible. He will be told. And if he holds a property, that is another obvious uh, <coughs> ineligibility, and he will be so told. And that is the basic checking. We will look at the information furnished and check whether that person is eligible or not. And if there is any deliberate uh, concealing of information, well, at this stage, we will believe what he declared. While waiting, we will conduct uh, random checks. And if it is found that um, the person deliberately uh, false, uh, makes some false declarations, he will be prosecuted. Please turn to <clears throat> paragraph 2.73. You talk about the random checks. It's actually the 300, ca 300 cases of uh, random checks selected by the computer. <laughs> Let's look at Table 10. You see that every year the number of new applications in 2008 is uh, 40,000. And 2012-13 is uh, 61,554 cases. The 300 cases, by comparison, is very low. Has it occurred to you that you will devote more resources on such random checks? As far as I know, for uh, a PRH unit, it will cost uh, $700,000 to construct, excluding land premium. Then why don't you do more random checks? I think we have to keep in mind what our purpose is. I agree with Mr. Chen. Yes, PRH unit is, a pre is precious resources. Don't forget that we don't rely solely on the random checks. When an applicant uh, was about is about to receive an, a housing allocation, he will have to go through the in-depth checking. We will invite him for an interview. We will go into detail of the checking of the information furnished. The emphasis is on the in-depth checking just before the allocation. We conduct an random checks as a deterrent effect to deter applicants from furnishing false information. So that is uh, an additional checking. Of course, we can uh, do more if resources allow. But that aside, we will have to look, it, look at it in the perspective of the applicants. The random checks is to send a message to applicants that they should not give us a false uh, dec declaration. But of course, for the applicants, they don't like it when we check everything all the time. The 300 random checks is an additional measure. We do not rely solely on the random checks to see whether the applicant is eligible. Mr. Chen, how did you decide on the 300 uh, applicants? So whether you have uh, 40,000 applicants is 300. Whether it's 60,000 appli uh, applications is still 300. How do you decide on the number 300? We consider our manpower level. On top of that, we keep in mind our purpose, as I said. This is not to see whether that person is eligible. It is an additional measure. We have considered all the factors. We are of the view that 300 is an appropriate figure. Of course, where uh, resources allow, um, we will prioritize and see how much resources is to be devoted into this. 
there is an internal consensus. Please refer to paragraph 2.74. It is said that the investigation time should be completed in around three months. If you refer to table 14 on page 45 in English version, we see that for a large number of such cases, the investigation time takes more than three months, some as much as six to nine months or over nine months. What's the explanation of the Housing uh, Authority? It's an investigation into a household. I have done a lot of investigations into a large corporation. It won't take as, mu as long as six months. I would defer to Mr. Liu. The assistant director. Thank you. It, yes, the progress of the investigation time is unsatisfactory. The central team uh, has looked into the reason for the long time taken, and we found that in the investigation, as Miss Wong said, that the manager has looked into the applications in detail, especially in this in, at the stage of uh, housing allocation. And very often the applicants said that, uh, well, the housing department has already looked into uh, our cases. And when they come to us, we found that that are still a lot of the documents required are outstanding. This is undesirable if the person refused to or, did, or fails to uh, furnish information or simply does not turn up for an interview, we can take the initiative to do more. Uh, there is uh, a guideline from the central team saying that uh, the investigation will have to be completed within three months. Otherwise, the case will, have, will be referred to the as manager or the assistant manager in the central team for following up. We hope that with the improvement measure in place, this will not happen. One more question. What about the breadth and uh, death of the annual check? Compared, comparing that with the interview just before the flat allocation, and what's the difference in terms of breadth and death? Ms. Wong? Well, I will answer uh, the perspective from housing allocation on average. About 30 minutes is a personal interview. All the information furnished will be verified. And on the day, perhaps some information has changed. The interview offers an opportunity for that to be changed and checked. If there are questions or suspicion, we'll ask the applicant to furnish further information. That is the in-depth checking just before the allocation. In relation to the central team investigation, I'll defer to Mr. Leo. The death will be deeper. Say, for example, a taxi driver. On the application, it's declared that uh, the income as a taxi driver is 10000 And if we think that it is reasonable, it's accepted. But when it comes to the central team for an in-depth check, we hear about this information, we'll check with the transport department to see if he is the owner of a taxi. Of course, he would have been asked this question at an earlier stage, whether he owns a taxi. But when the case reaches the central team, sometimes depending on the circumstance, we will go to get information from uh, banks. The breadth is wider. Of course, we will meet the applicant, but prior to the interview, we may do more preparation work, say, for example, to get information from the transport department. And if necessary, we will get further information to see if he has, he has other asset from the bank. <coughs> In the interview just before the flat allocation, well, my suggestion is that uh, the housing department can do more and not um, a huge in-depth checking, but during the interview, you can ask about a lot of information to the facts. So you can look into the program of the interview to see if there is any room for improvement because PRH 
is a precious resources. So you have to seriously consider this. You will interview every applicant. You will have to think about what information you are seeking and what information you'd like to get from the applicant to see if the interview fits uh, will achieve your purpose. Uh, please take that into consideration. Next, Mr. Alan Leung. Thank you. Of course, uh, the LegCo is very grateful to the um, Audit Commission for doing the audit. The LegCo is very concerned, especially the panel on housing. The housing department, the housing uh, authority, has be, has been saying that uh, flat allocation is achieved uh, it, uh, within three years, and we think that is a bit. Um, it's a little bit um, exaggerated. Hopefully, through the um, audit investigation, we will find out more about the progress. The QPS started in September 2005, that is, the uh, quota and points system. And the waiting list serves an important purpose. First, it gives an accurate picture uh, for the administration about the demand for PRH uh, units, so that they can plan to as to how many is to be produced and and um, how fast they should be produced. And for prospective applicants, they can make preparation and plan about their housing need plan for their housing needs the accuracy of the waiting list is important but from the audit report i see that the waiting list is not very accurate if you rely on the waiting list to calculate how many PRX units is to be produced. Well, you will fail if you plan if you use it to plan for your housing. Say, for example, when you can move out of the SDU, the subdivided unit, you won't be planning properly either. <coughs> Let me first ask this. Please refer to paragraph two point two four. In 2013, as at the 31st of March 2013, 33,600 applicants, we're talking about general ap applicants, non-elderly applicants, they have been waiting for three years or more. 7,552 applicants have been waiting for 5 to 10 years. If you take that all into account, well, uh, 15 cases have, has been, have, been over, or have been waiting for over uh, 10 years. So it's altogether 29% of, of general applicants. In 2.27, paragraph 2.27, the audit noted that in 2012, the housing department carried out a special exercise to find out the reason why some for some cases the waiting time is so long. The special exercise showed that forty percent of such cases involved uh, special circumstances, say for example, change of uh, house, household particulars, 8%, refusal to accept housing offers with reason, 27%, and other circumstances, 5%. For the other 60%, no mention has been given as to whether there are valid reasons. <clears throat> so in relation to the special exercise in 2012, have you followed up on the 60% of the cases with no valid reason? I will first defer and then I, I will first answer and then I will defer to the uh, director or his colleagues. 
about um, paragraph 2.27, about the 60% of the cases um, in which no mention has been given as to whether there are valid reasons. When the Housing Department makes arrangements uh, for PRH production, of course, um, the waiting list is a very important reference. And as to the waiting time, yes. Um, public, a lot of um, the people in society will use that information. And the waiting list refer to number of applicants being housed in the past 12 months. And that is the time from the first registration to the first um, housing offer made. And as to whether we can use the actual waiting time, is subject to a lot of variants because the actual waiting time is subject to the choice of the applicant and the number and the size of the household. And we find that for those with a longer waiting time, they are waiting for urban uh, district and or larger flats. If we use that, the understanding of the waiting time will be different. And as to whether we can inform every applicant as to how long they will have to wait is difficult because there are factors that is out, that are out of the control of the housing department. We have mentioned that already. Well, of course, for the housing department, we would like to know more. There is uh, such a need. Um, well, whether we use uh, the defined uh, waiting time or the actual waiting time, for some cases, the waiting time is long. That's why we u we conduct an analysis, say, for example, with the aid of the computer. And it will take time for us to find out the actual reason. We need to do some in-depth investigation. Well, for the first, first allocation is done by um, the computer. If that is turned down, since we give them three choices, for the second offer, we will have to find out what the actual needs of the applicant is, and we will choose a units that um, matches, units that match with um, the such needs to see. But of course, that depends on um, the supply of uh, such flats. Perhaps um, the director. Mm -hmm. A couple of things. Um, obviously, I, I have to point out that the average waiting time, in fact, has been confirmed by the director of audit as being an accurate. Um, basis on which to calculate, because after all, as, as the uh, chief, as the uh, secretary has said, um, we can't control their def their decision on whether to to accept or not a particular offer. Um, as far as the um, as far as the the uh, the, the question of uh, the accuracy of the waiting time, um, the key issue, as as we see it, is really their registration number, because we do publish. At what point are we dealing with? In other words, what number are you on, and how far away or are you being considered within the uh, the, the detailed investigation stage? But as as, as the secretary has said, the, the challenge for us, and, and we did explain this in our paper to the housing panel in October, is that we've been monitoring this very closely for the last three years, and, and definitely the waiting time is going up. So we're, we're trying to look at that. So the second part of the question is, when we identify someone whose waiting time exceeds three years as part of this annual exercise, then we look at those in more detail to find out why. Now, some cases, unfortunately, their waiting time includes a period where they're simply not being considered at all. You know, they may be in prison or they may be waiting for people to come in from China. For others, I'm afraid the reality is that there are cases where, for example, large families, we don't have enough units to accommodate them. At the, at the time or in the district that they want accommodation. So we're looking at, at ways to deal with that, for example, offering two flats to families to try and get them into, uh, into units quicker. But this is, I'm afraid, a, a dynamic situation. It's not a fixed situation. So we need to be looking at it on a constant basis, and that's what we're doing. Mr. Prescott, um, the, uh, uh, Mr. Leung asked, the 60 percent that have no reason been given, why was that the case? Well, as I, as I was explaining, the, uh, the, 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 there are many, many different reasons why people um, haven't been given particular uh, explanation. 
Um, it depends very much on the individual cases. And when we can, we will speak to the, uh, to the applicants, give them an explanation, as I say, based on our, our, our more in-depth investigation after that, uh, that uh, annual investigation. Chairman, my question is, whether within a certain time frame we would be able to have information on the remaining 60% cases. That might be due to various uh, reasons, but will we get this information? For the 60% cases, no valid reasons have been given at the time when the report was released. So, Secretary, will you consider providing this information? It, we should be fair. For those rejected cases, at least they have the right to know the reasons for their rejection. Just like the um, Hong Kong t t TV license, and they need to know the reasons as well. Ms. Wong? Well, it's difficult for us to provide the information in retrospect on members' requests because for those uh, not yet allocated with the flat in 2012, by now they ha have already uh, been allocated with the flat. But in fact, the, um, it is an ongoing exercise. Uh, the analysis is done annually, and we have just completed the 2013 exercise. And if members re members may recall that we provided a report to the panel on housing in November on the situation in 2013, and we think the situation is evolving, and we have constantly new applicants in the waiting list and uh, from the situation between January and June this year for those waiting over five years without the first offer there were 2,100 cases at that time and according to our analysis well the reasons um, as the reasons change all the time they are not kept in our computer system and we uh, our staff will look at them manually um, 33 percent I have to do with uh, some reasons as stated, and for some other cases, there might be medical circumstances or social welfare um, reasons why reallocation is needed. And uh, there are also some cancelled time and also some cancelled slots, or pro for some reasons, they might have uh, switched to another queue. And these are the situations that we uh, have um, verified, and some might do to uh, what uh, a, a number of reasons instead of just one. And as director was it just now, for larger households, they may insist a particular district. So we and and we don't have any suitable flats for that large household in the district. So they might need to wait longer. And uh, in the paper to the panel on housing, you can see that according to our analysis, for those with longer waiting time, they opted for urban or extended urban area, or they might be larger uh, households, applicants, and these are the general reasons. But as I said just now, the allocation exercise is ongoing. It's difficult to find the information. Um, in the past, because for uh, su uh, unsuccessful applicants, they might have got a, a flat now. So at, now, now that the report is released, we like members of the public to understand why they needed to wait for so long. Because we're not only talking about past incidents; this will happen in the future as well. So we need to explain to the public what the situation is. Secretary, Chairman, well, on um, Ms. Wong's point, in the paper submitted to the panel on housing, on the allocation situation as at the end of June 2013, in Para 23, we analyzed uh, the situation. And there were 900 cases with five years or more waiting time. and. There were different reasons for the long waiting time. That's on page six on, or page eight on the uh, supplementary information submitted. That's R one stroke three, Gen two. This is an 
annually based analysis. If possible, we can have a further breakdown of the reasons to see how we can improve our methodology. But uh, like uh, Chairman said, we'd like to be more, uh, more accountable. Alan, we also note that in this um, in this audit report, there is one uh, point raised. If you look at the non-elderly singleton applicants, there are uh, eleven thousand to a uh, hundred hundred uh, hundred twelve thousand. Uh, that accounts for half of the uh, total waiting list. So the QPS now encourages. Um, or provides incentives for those uh, reaching 18 to apply as early as possible. So, for university students reaching 18, he might apply as soon as possible, but once he gets a job in the future, he will become ineligible. That's uh, very likely. And yet, this applicant is still on the waiting list. So when he reaches 18 and every month he gets another point, and say if so, so there will be a loss of 12 points if the um, applicant applies um, when he's 19 instead of 18. So are you in fact encouraging applicants to register themselves right when they reach 18? And for these cases, will there be any um, revetting uh, or vetting process to shorten the uh, waiting list, Secretary? I agree with the auditor's observation. In fact, after implementation of the QPS, we consider a number of factors. As far as the points are concerned, first come, first served, and also the time on the waiting list. And for older applicants, we would like to uh, give them offers earlier. And the third re factor is whether he is an, um, currently a PRH tenant. And with the auditor's observation, and also, the uh, deliberation by the long-term st housing st strategy steering committees uh, on um, QPS. We identified the problems, and that's why in the uh, long-term housing strategies consultation paper, we suggest that first of all, there should be a QPS. It should be reviewed, and we, we should um, consider whether we should uh, adhere to the existing practice with QPS. However, Definitely, there will be more applicants. That's the uh, dilemma of a uh, QPS. You need to, you, you want to acc accord priority to uh, those in need, and that's the purpose of the QPS. And yet, the QPS will encourage people to uh, join the queue earlier. And for those waiting for some time. Uh, without a housing offer, um, the applicant might have become ineligible, perhaps because of an increase in their salaries, and there should be a mechanism to check on a regular basis their eligibility, and that's also the recommendation. For general applicants or household applicants, we don't have um, such a mechanism because, on average, they get a housing offer within three years' time, and by that stage, uh, the income and assets limits, etc., will be uh, looked into in greater detail. For those under QPS, because of the longer waiting time, we do agree that a regular checking me mechanism should be introduced. And after the end of the consultation period, we will forward our proposal to the HA for further consideration. Alan, you can wait for your second round, Mr. Raymond Wong. Thank you, Chairman. On Secretary speaking note, well, it's cliche. The audit report is published. It's a comprehensive report, and we and uh, you also agree with the report. I can I can tell you, if you want to implement all the recommendations, you will take at least ten years. So you're not being sincere. Well, uh, Professor Anthony Chang, uh, you uh, are responsible for these. Uh, Problems in 2008 when I um, assumed office as large co member, um, there was a pu public housing estate in Chum Shui Po. Um, we have 14 estates, and we face these problems every day. 
we didn't understand how complex the QPS was. So you could say whatever you want. I really can't uh, tell you the details um, here. We have special cases, and it's impossible for us to help them. We wrote to the housing department. We got a um, bureaucratic uh, reply. Uh, we talk, you're talking about the guidelines, etc. You know, for family reunion, well, the four um, of them just kept on waiting. Too many such cases. So, after reading this report recently, I told my uh, staff at the ward offices that they might they need to uh, read this report very carefully because this report contains information far more comprehensive than that provided by the housing department. We looked for many, uh, many answers, and now all the answers are contained in this report. As for you, you never provide any comprehensive information uh, or admit your mistakes. For example, for the mistakes I mentioned in the, the report, you never admit them. So it's just a waste of breath discussing it time and again in the panel on housing. For example, on housing allocation, I raised this item on the uh, it was put on the agenda, and then you submitted a paper cooking up all the figures. So, Mr. Wong, what's your question? Of course, I have questions. I have a whole pile of paper of questions. It's very simply put, this is an open society. We have right to resources. And if we have information, we can have plan and basis on how to plan our lives. It's, it has a great impact on me whether I have a public housing unit, on whether I can survive. For example, uh, there's a four-member mem uh, household waiting to be housed, uh, waiting for family reunion. Well, then you should think how they can be helped. You're creating a lot of family problems. We need resources. In the end, it all boils down to lack of house or inadequate housing units. Even if there are sufficient housing units, you have problems with the system, with the QPS. So you still have problems. We're talking about fifty that four thousand five hundred plus uh, underoccupied flats, your flats, over fifty thousand. Secretary, I don't want to reprimand you, Mr. Wong. Ask your question. Back to the audit report. I'll save my breath. We have. Many questions. Para 2.2. Yes. Now, the average cost per flat is about 700,000 according to the housing department, not including the land cost, of course. And it also takes about five years to construct a flat. I think the cost doesn't cover the 5,000 staff out of the 8,500 in the housing department responsible for housing allocation and management. Now, comparing to private development projects, apart, um, you know, taking, excluding the use of uh, materials, etc., is this figure reasonable? Secretary, I'd like to respond to. Uh, some points raised by Mr. Wong first. I hope Mr. Wong will not just rely on uh, these speaking notes because in the report, the housing department has given its re response to the observations. I agree that we need to enhance the transparency. In 2011-12, the housing department began a comprehensive analysis on um, cases with longer waiting time, that's when. That's because members of the HA, HXC, the subsidized, subsidized Housing Committee, and I was the chairman, I make this suggestion. And there were some 50,000 UO flats requiring priority um, action. Some involved uh, elderly. Tenants, and uh, due to compassionate reasons, we don't want to um, 
take priority action. And in fact, in the consultation forum uh, on several occasions, we explained that uh, for some yo cases, they are asked to move b because they um, the situation is more serious. As for the as for the question on para two point two, usually contractor will be commissioned to construct the flat, so the construction period is largely the same. But for housing department, we use um, a vast quantity of prefabricated materials, so we should be able to compress the uh, construction period. But um, the lead time is also needed, for example, for uh, uh, going through the town planning procedure for change of land use. We need to consult the district councils. Some may have views on the number of floors and the design and also community facilities to be provided and that takes a considerable amount of time and so on 2.12 uh, 2.11 <clears throat> now the average waiting time for general applicant is 2.7 years um that's between registration and the first housing offer so the frozen period will be excluded. Now, many uh, general applicants were housed uh, after waiting for more than three years. And we also discussed the relevant issue at the panel meeting. As mentioned just now, Secretary, just now, Director also made this point for frozen period. That is, for example, not fulfilling the residence requirement, the applicant is is imprisoned, or the res, uh, the uh, applicant is pending approval of family members for family reunion. Now, for family members waiting for family reunion, the period will be frozen. Does that mean that for the remaining members, there is no housing need? I think you should be more flexible in handling these cases. You should um, exercise your discretion or be compassionate. Now, what's the basis of exercising the, your discretion? Because we receive some cases, we ask for discretionary um, treatment, and uh, you can't do that, Secretary. Now, sometimes the application is on hold, pending um, arrival of family members, because usually we need the seven-year residence requirement. Now, Mr. Wong. It's right in pointing out that some cases do have special family circumstances. Sometimes I received letters from logical members, and I do ask my staff to analyze the such cases and see what can be done to resolve the problems. Uh, so yes, we do exercise our discretion, and at various levels of the housing housing department, we exercise our discretion appropriately. Um, to, and Ms. Wong, as uh, Secretary puts it just now, we allow the applicant to file the applications. But at the time of the housing offer, half of the members of the household should ha have fulfilled the seven-year residence requirement. And that's also a rational utilization of, of uh, housing resources. Now, but we ha exercise discretions, for example, on cases referred by the Social Welfare Department. After all, there should be fairness and transparency in public housing allocation. The criteria are clearly set out in our uh, application form and on the website. And if every case requires discretion, this will add complexity to the application procedure. As Secretary mentioned just now, for special circumstances, for example, for special reasons, the Social Welfare Department has referred a particular case, we'll definitely consider if the Social Welfare Department has recommended a particular case, we'll definitely consider it. We need some figures in relation to the frozen period. We need the specific details so that we understand how the discretion is exercised. You should take the initiative in giving us this information. For members, um, for logical members, 
uh, the, what offices we uh, actually in a haze because we don't know this information. We don't have this information. People don't need to come to us for help. Actually, they could come to you. But you take this attitude. You can't help them resolve the problem. That's why they turn to us. And in the audit report, it's very clear. Publicity is problematic for those affected. They don't even know the reasons, like the chairman put it just now. So please stop, stop um, de deploying rhetoric. Uh, now, in 2.15 of the audit report, we see that in relation to the uh, care basis of calculation of the average waiting time, the auditor made his criticism. And the basis of its calculation were not readily disclosed through common channels accessible to the general public, for example, the HA's website, pamphlets, etc. Now, for PRH applicants, many of them are grassrooters, they are not that uh, knowledgeable. So, uh, please come up with ways to help them understand better. Have you considered it? If the if they don't understand the reasons of the uh, fr the frozen period being implemented, etc., there might be um, delay in the or they may, this may affect the patients in waiting for housing offer. So they should understand the the uh, p the basis of calculation, etc., so, so that they don't feel aggrieved. Secretary, please answer me. How can you help the uh, waiting? Applicants to be more patient so that they don't feel aggrieved. Secretary. Now, how do we uh, enhance transparency and how do we make sure there's more clarity of information? As I said in my opening remarks, uh, I agree we should do something. We will see what we can do to improve the situation. Please um, let us know the time frames uh, to facilitate our report writing. Now, um, if you say that we should include information in the XJ's website and uh, pamphlet and so on, that, that won't take too long. On case analysis, uh, where the waiting time is long, or even for frozen cases, when we do the analysis, uh, and every year we submit the analysis to the pen on housing, we do mention that. But if you want us to provide more uh, details in the analysis, we could consider it. Now, my concern is that uh, the housing department and the government have the duty to reach out to the residents, or you could go through LegCo members and district council members. At least you tell them, explain things to them, so that for us in the front line, district councillors or us, when we, we um, meet with um, people on uh, public housing, allocation issues, we could explain things to them, but you never told us. Now you just tell them, I'll give you a document, and you just read the document on your own. You know, electrical members or our assistants or district councillors, I think you have to tell them. Yes, I think you've made your point, Mr. Mascot. Actually, um, we do try to provide that information. And indeed, in the paper that we put to the housing panel in November, paragraphs of 17, 18, and 19 did set out in some detail the exact reasons why and the number of people covered by those reasons. Now, just to quote, residence requirements were the, f the majority by a long way. Out of the 6,000 or, or the, the 5,800 odd, 5,500 are residence requirements. In other words, they haven't qualified under the 50% rule. For others, the smaller numbers are the specific requests by the applicants, they're getting divorced or something, they're only 130. Institutional care, 60. Uh, misdeeds in previous Mr. PRH Prescott, can you direct us what paper you Yeah, please. it's the panel paper that we put in November. Yeah. It, the no, detail you, is all uh, there. If you, if, you, if you refer to any paper, can you direct us? We have an uh, index there. Yeah, it is the supplementary information uh, being. Okay, Gen 2 is it, right? Yeah. My government is not Okay. okay. My, yes, we have the document. I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about what he's trying to say here in response to me. I'm saying you should use this information to pacify the public, make them be willing to wait patiently so they won't have so many grievances and they won't come to us so often. And at the same time, um, you know, for us in the front line who often have the opportunity to meet with people like this, then we are able to explain to them clearly uh, what uh, uh, it's about. Well, I, I'm sure they've heard you. Now available on our website. It has been reported both to the panel and to the Housing Authority 
subsidised housing. 得啦，你唔使答啦，你唔好讲网页啦，大佬。Forbid, forget about the website. To share it with uh, members of the LegCo and yeah. the district councillors, so it's yeah. it's available information. Okay, thank you, John. Secretary, I think what Mr. Raymond Wong is saying is that whether we could be more specific now for um, members uh, when they receive such cases and what offices that we could be more targeted in our approach. I think maybe we can do this. We all want to get this right, right? Mr. Pescott uh, was just referring to the document. Now, the document has to be submitted to the Housing Authority. It's also uploaded on the website. It's also submitted to LegCo, so it's on the LegCo's website. At the same time, we could make arrangements for us to meet with LegCo members and their assistants and um, um, give them analysis so they, we, they could all understand what, is, what the situation is like. Next, Mr. Gary Chen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. If I could ask the witness to refer to page 7, table 1 of the audit report, or page 8 on the English version. Table 1, in the page 8 in the English version. The uh, AWT targets for PRG applications listed up. Now, there, I would like to focus on general applicants. There are two types under general applicants. Family applicant about 47 percent and single elderly applicants about 4 percent of the applications. And you can see for these two types of applicants, only single elderly applicants for them, there is a specific target, two years. For family applicants, there is not a specific um, objective uh, policy target. It just says that um, together for the two types, um, the overall waiting time is about three years. But as many members pointed out, for people uh, waiting for PRH, they have housing needs. They don't have um, permanent um, Residents they may have to move often because of high rent. If um, they have a definite idea of when they might uh, get PRH at least a year, then in planning, their, um, uh, f uh, making their financial plans is very important. Now, why is it that for it's only for a single elderly applicant there's a two-year target? How come for a family applicant there could not be a target? If for the two queues, uh, if there are separate targets for them, uh, what would be the difficulties in doing so? Secretary for family applicant, the um, AWT target is about three years. Now, I'm not talking about average. You're saying for a single elderly applicant is two years. As for family applicant, you say on average is three years. That means some is three years for others is more than three years. Secretary, uh, Mr. Gary Chen asked this question, and Mr. Ellen Leung asked this question too. It all led to a point that there are many on the waiting list. They are in poor housing condition. If they cannot be sure, when they might get a PRH is not fair to them. So could you please respond to Mr. Gary Chen's question? Uh, average waiting time, we talk about three years. Of course, uh, there are um, some with longer waiting time, some with shorter one. We're talking about the um, um, date of the, uh, registration and the first housing offer. Now, after the first housing offer, the applicant turns it down, and then the, ho the applicant has the second and a third chance and maybe he has preferences for a particular district or the sizes of the units. And, of course, it will vary from individual to individual. Now, the average waiting time is based on the first housing offer now. But for some people, uh, they turn down the first offer. Maybe they're waiting for a particular district, or they may want to wait for bigger units. I've, I've explained that with, there is a shortage of bigger units. Now, he's talking about for a single elderly applicant, um, the AWT target is two years. How come for a family applicant, there isn't one? Can you please answer the question? Well, I did answer the question. I'm saying for a family applicant, it's three years. Three years is the average for elderly, uh, two years. Uh, basically, you can do that within two years. Now, yes, Secretary, you might say that uh, that's the first housing offer. They turn it down, and that's the second or third offer. But it's the same arrangement for elderly persons, right? 
uh, two years is also the average waiting time. How come for elderly you could uh, put down two years so specifically? How come for family applicant you can't write down three there? Ms. Wong, uh, if I may add, this is a rather technical issue. Three years of um, uh, first housing offer. We talk about the general applicants for the general queue. General applicant covers both family and single elderly applicants. That's how we have put it originally. But for single elderly applicants, we believe uh, they ought to be given more priority. That's why within this um, bigger set, we are doing more for single um, elderly applicants. We try to allocate units to them sooner. So that's why for single elderly applicants, two years on a gen in general is three years. Um, so that's how it works. It's not the case that there is a target for single elderly applicant, um, but there is not one for family applicant for our applicants actually three years. Table one, the audit uh, shows you this report. I showed you this report in the past, and our member asked, how come you couldn't write down three there? Can you, it's a straightforward question, can you please answer it? Why didn't you put down three there? If you say on average three years, why didn't you put it down there? Well, we said so, but it's the Director of Audit's report. We explained it to the Director of Audit, but uh, the Director of Audit believed this is the better way to present um, the case, so we can't tell him he can't uh, put it that way, but I think we've explained the reasons. Um, to him. Now, can I put it another way? Why can't you make them two separate queues? What are the difficulties in so doing? Secretary, as Ms. Wong explained, for general applicants, family, or single elderly, the average waiting time target is three years. That's average, okay? So in that means that some may wait for longer and some shorter than three years. For elderly applicant, we want to do even better, so that's why we set uh, it at two years. That's the internal target uh, we've set uh, within the Housing Authority. Now, if I may turn to the question of waiting. Now, there are many young people who apply for public housing as soon as they turn 18, but uh, you might uh, of course, appreciate this. Uh, when they find, uh, get work or they get a good job, they will no longer be eligible, actually. In 1993, the Housing Authority brought in the revalidation mechanism. Where, where are you, please? Can, let, can I finish first? In 1993, the revalidation check was brought in, but in 2000, um, because the waiting list was shorter, so there's no longer a revalidation. For single out, um, non elderly single applicant, there's a large number on the waiting list, but um, maybe it's not the real figure, the real demand. And um, the um, audit has um, highlighted this issue as well because uh, of this um, phenomenon, it may lead to wrong estimate of demands. So are you aware of this situation? Uh, did you only notice it because the audit mentioned it, or uh, did you know way uh, long ago, um, since 1993, just that in 2000 the waiting list was shortened, so you no longer d did revaluate revalidation check? Secretary, when I responded to Mr. Ellen Leung's question earlier, I said that uh, when there's a, if, if there's any point system, it would encourage people to join the queue. Uh, there's an objective um, uh, effect of it because um, with a, a wait longer waiting time, there are higher points. Uh, we have to notice the situation. That's why in the past year, at the steering committee of the LTHS, we have considered the QPS. We have considered how points should be scored. And it's true, as Mr. Chen put it, um, this may not be the true picture of the amounts. That's why the LTHS steering committee suggested that for QPS applicants, there should be revalidation check um, to look at their inset, uh, income and asset um, level and so on. But of course, the revalidation uh, for the QPS system, it's not just about revalidation check. It's all about how points could be scored. Uh, we will review that as well. Uh, so I think um, uh, actually this all this recommendation is in line with uh, what we are planning to do. Are you going to do, do the review only after the LTHS um, 
consultation period is finished. Well, um, on the second of next month, the consul three months consultation period of the LTHS doc consultation is uh, over, and then they would we will, on the basis of the reviews received, um, take further action. But uh, I don't think it should take too long because so far we haven't heard any opposition to that suggestion. But anyway, we must respect the mechanism, and we'll wait till the end of the consultation period, and then we'll follow up. Uh, and now we'll also refer the matter to the Housing Authority for further follow-up. Okay, then we'll put in our report that this will be followed up. Now, since the Secretary just mentioned the point system, I'd like to talk about the QPS. Now, the system right now is that the longer you wait, the higher points you score. But for housing needs, there are people with more pressing needs than others. And the, the government's always told us that resources should be reserved for those with the um, stronger needs. It's not for everybody. If that's the case, the current QPS cannot really reflect the um, intention of um, giving public housing resources to those with the most pressing needs, but rather um, the resources now given to those uh, having the longest wait. So what can you do, Secretary, to enhance the QPS so those of the uh, strongest and housing needs could um, get PRX sooner. Secretary, there are three elements um, under the QPS. One is the waiting time, the length of the waiting time. Second is the age. And the third element is whether the applicant is already in uh, subsidized housing. Uh, PRH, that is. And another point is that if the applicant is now not in PRH, maybe he has stronger needs. Now, for, for these three elements, what is the weighting of these elements? That's something we will review. And then in the LTHS consultation document, we have mentioned that for those older, we would like uh, them to have allocation sooner. So we're going to review the QPS. You're talking about those aged 45 or above? Yes. In the LTHS consultation document, we hope to um, bring the age down to 35 eventually, but we'll first start with those uh, aged 45 or above. Now, for those aged 35 or above or 45 or above, perhaps they are uh, compared to the younger ones, they have less uh, upward mobility. That's why. Thank you. Mr. Chen, page 76 of the older report in the Chinese version, para 4.51. Yes, please. Fire away. Uh, 4.15, sorry, para. That's uh, page 89 in the English version. Now, on false declarations, uh, you handle them in two different ways. One is that uh, uh, there is the uh, registration of civil service unit dealing with the cases. Now, whether it doesn't matter whether the uh, irregularities would affect the applicant's eligibility, referrals would be made to the prosecution section, and there's another queue under the waiting list. Um, and so the waiting list unit would only cancel the uh, registration when the false declaration would affect the eligibility of the applicant. Otherwise, the WLU will proceed with the case. And for those on the waiting list, uh, there has to be sufficient evidence that the false application was made internationally before you were cancelled refer the cancelled cases to the prosecution section. I want to ask why that's the case. How come these are all false applica uh, declarations, but there are two ways to handle them? Perhaps I could uh, invite some um, department colleagues to explain the actual operation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The um, audit is pointed out how come that in one case is uh, in, in terms of registration, the other is in terms of uh, waiting, um, that we have different approaches dealing with false declarations. Well, actually, now we have um, standardized the approach. There won't be a, um, a situation of a more relaxed approach or a more stringent approach. This is in response to the order's recommendations. Where did you do so? We've already issued the uh, departmental guidelines to colleagues. Can you please give us a copy of the guidelines, please? And last question. Uh, table 17.
On page 53 in the English version, it says that there are 470 uh, units that are not allocated under the expressed um, allocation scheme. Why, over a number of years, these are still not allocated uh, under the express scheme, express flat allocation scheme? I would defer to my colleague. Who is to take this question? Perhaps I will attempt to answer this question and I will defer to my colleagues for supplement. Under the EFAS, the Express Flight Allocation Scheme, it is an annual exercise in about July to September. We will group together flats um, that are not chosen over a number of years or units that are not very popular under the scheme. In between Se July and September, we pull the flats together. After this time, we will stop pulling the flats together because we will have to have a deadline. And for some applicants, uh, they for some uh, units, they are available only after uh, September, so they did not make it in time to be pulled. We have to take additional measures. If flats are made available for applicants' consideration, and if we are aware that the flat is not chosen in a number of rounds, we will pull the flat into the EFAS in that year. And every year we will accumulate about 1,000 of such flats for allocation. We will now take one more step. If the flat is under consideration, as soon as we know that it is not taken, it will be grouped under the AFAS. Any supplement? Well, I will wait for the next round. Mr. Ng Lang Singh, after Mr. Ng, I would like to have a break at half past ten because uh, some members will have to go to the econo uh, panel on um, commerce and economic development. Mr. Ng. Well, about the value for money audit. And I think it is of utmost importance because we're talking about housing, in particular PRH. The housing department owns most of the flats in Hong Kong. We're talking about 700,000 units. At the, house, at the beginning, in uh, paragraph 2.2, .2, it talks about such flats being heavily subsidized. So I'd like to say something about this. It is in relation to use of public money. Uh, we have uh, rates, management fees and uh, rent, and land uh, rent. You charge a rent, and you put in a lot of um, public money to subsidize such flats. We look at the public expenditure on this. 700,000 in paragraph 2.2. Is it the average production cost? Is it based on the latest figure? Or should there be an annual adjustment to give us the latest figure so that the public will know how much is put into building of each PRH flat so that taxpayers will have an idea? Is there such a practice? If not, uh, will you consider? Um, put uh, making available such information. In paragraph 2.2, .2, the 700,000, it refers to the average construction cost for a PRH flat. It excludes maintenance and management. Of course, we charge rent. And the set fixing of the rent level in, in, in accordance with the affordability of the tenant, it, it, it may not be the same as the operating cost. Under the legislation, there will be a rental review once every two years. The review 
takes into account uh, changes of income of tenants. If it's an upward adjustment, according to the legislation, the maximum adjustment is 10%. So the, of course, uh, by this the expenditure far exceeds the income. Mr. Leung asked about Mr. Ng asked about the seven hundred thousand. It's not the actual figure; it's uh, the construction cost only. But there are other costs. Say, for example, staff cost. If you make available the actual figure, then we'll be able to see. Uh, to view it from a value for money point of view, it's not just about the. It's not just uh, seven hundred thousand. If you give us the actual figure, well, I believe that it will it will uh, be much higher than that. And I think you have the figure. And please give us the figure. Give us the information. So uh, for the different types of families, how much goes into subsidizing um, such units for? These families. I think it will be difficult if we have to break it down into type of families. We have all the information made available. We can find the information from our accounts. Um, say, for example, the maintenance and repair management to give you further information. Well, it takes about five years and uh, three years to construct the flat. The flat. If you can give us all the information that information that goes into the cost of um, the uh, flat, then we will know the level of subsidy, so that the public will know the level of subsidy that goes into each flat. Please give us the information. Uh, yes, we will give uh, further information. Just do as much as just uh, as far as possible. I have another question. Paragraph 2.9. Waiting list. The search. 2013, 228,000. Three years ago, it was 50% uh, of that. So is there any analysis into the profile of the applicant, say, for example, age group? To see the changes, and what about that of um, ap the occupations of the applicants? You'll be able to get glimpses the profile of applicants. We will have the report of the population policy consultation soon. Then you will be able to get some information about um, the pressure. For the, the quota and point system, because those are individual applicants. But of course, the general waiting list are family applicants, so it covers a whole range. So we'll provide that information. Uh, near. Oh. <coughs> I hope that something can be done about this, because the pressure may be higher and higher. We're talking about uh, those who are studying will start to queue as soon as they reach 18, and there are more and more such students. In Table 1, for single elderly applicant, two years, do you have information showing that in the previous three years, for each year, how many of such applicants has died when it's their turn? And the change in income. When they are given an offer, how many of the applicants have uh, an income that exceeds the limit? Director? I have to say, I, w I think it would be very difficult for us to find out people who've died we, because we would just terminate the case. Mm. And, and invariably, they may have died five or six years before we even get around to checking them if they're on the quota and point system. So I don't think we can provide that information. Okay. We'll have a look. And see what we can provide, but I don't think we have that. <coughs> if we can find the information, then it will give us a better picture. 
because there must be a lot of wasted work because you you are not on top of the situation you don't you you don't know fully about the situation the resources is not to put to an optimum use and in two point two one after nineteen ninety two point twelve after ninety seven uh, the longest waiting time was 6.5 years. It's now shortened to three years. It's a good thing. From the value or for money approach. What about immigrants? Well, we're talking about uh, 800,000 um, people coming to Hong Kong after 97 from the mainland, from South Asia, or even from France. Do they apply for PRH units? And is there any increase in percentage? Any information director, uh, uh, um, secretary? Well, we will see if the department can find the information on hand. Oh, but now for the applicants, you don't differentiate. Um, you don't uh, differentiate them be because of their ethnicity. Because we have the discrimination ordinance. We're an open economy. You have to take into consider the pressure as a result of immigrants because they will enjoy the public resources. We want to know the trend. The requirement is seven-year residency. That's mm. the basic requirement. Yes. It doesn't really matter whether they're from South Asia or England, in my case, or, or China. Mm. It is the seven-year residence requirement. But I think um, the Honourable Member does have a point in that uh, we do try to ensure that we're looking at that as an issue. And in the long-term housing strategy, the, the figures that have been put together looking at the projected demand does take into account issues such as that. So we do, but on the basis of the residence requirements. Uh, I think it's related to the uh, long-term housing strategy. Two point, paragraph 2.15. There are many different ways of calculation. Will the basis and computation method be accurate? Say, for example, whether the three-year waiting time is accurate. Is there enough information for the public to verify? Well. There's an average waiting time of three years. For those who have been waiting for over three years, is there any mechanism for such applicants uh, to ask uh, questions? Well, if you wait for longer than three years, uh, is there any mechanism for you to go and ask why and what's happening so that the applicants will get an idea of what is going on? Any such procedure, any cases, Director? Um, we believe that the figures on average waiting time are accurate, and indeed I don't think the Director of Audit has any challenge on that, on the basis of our calculation. Um, in terms of uh, over three years, I think there's a number of options here. First, when we do our, our annual exercise to look at the waiting list and the waiting list times, we do actually pick up um, families that have been well over three years, so four, five, etc. And we will then look into their specific cases and try to identify why it is that they've been that length. But of course, um, individual uh, applicants can always ap approach the department for further information. And we do actually uh, publicize their, their, their number so that they know at what point they are in the queue. So the information should already be there. But as I say, uh, they, they have a contact point within the department. They can follow up. Okay. So they can follow up. It is very important because you have made it clear that there is an average waiting time of three years. Now, paragraph 2.24, in table three, that um, is seven percent.
Well, have you looked into such cases as to why、uh, the actual waiting time is、uh, five to less than ten years, Director? Once, and then I'll ask Agnes、oh, well, to, to、uh, supplement.、Um, yes, we do look into this because, of course, we do our annual exercise to find out why people have、mm. been longer. I mean, the reasons are as many reasons as there are people, to be honest with you, because it's individual. But it comes down to basically, I guess, three things. First, they want a particular district or a particular location. Secondly, their family size is larger than the flats we have available at the particular time. Uh, and thirdly,、uh, it's、uh, it's an issue about there may be other reasons, in other words, frozen periods or what have you. So those are the the basic three. But perhaps Agnes can supplement. Wang Lishi. Hey, I want to say to Miss Wang, I think the director has given the、um, general reasons, and for some reasons, for some cases, at different times, there are different reasons. Maybe all three, and all together, it results in a longer waiting time. Say, for example, the size of the household and the district chosen is not、uh, a, will make it difficult for for us、uh, to give them a flat if there is no such flat available. Well, when it comes to location, it, have you considered that now the waiting list is longer, two hundred thousand? A hundred percent increase compared to three years ago. Have you considered this? That they can only choose two times if they want a particular district. They should only be given two choices. If you rejected both, then you will have to get to the back of the queue. So、in fact, we have looked at various permutations.、Um, for example, as you've suggested, just two offers instead of three. But we feel actually that, that、um, quite often it, it is it is reasonable to allow people three offers because、uh, perhaps the second offer, when it's flicked up by the computer, is is really not acceptable. So three offers we think is is reasonable in the current circumstance. We've also looked at other issues like. Um, maybe having smaller districts. At the moment, we have、mm. uh, three districts or four districts. Can we make it five or six or seven? We've looked at all of these options, okay. but well, we're comfortable with the current. I understand that、uh, there are difficulties, but we're talking about over two hundred thousand people on the waiting list. So some people may be very picky, and、um, it, it would take them five to ten years, and still they are not happy with any of the offers. I just want to improve efficiency, so you have to take into consider、uh, possibilities to improve. We 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 agree with that, and indeed, the the point is that if someone rejects their third offer, then they have to wait another year before they can reapply. So there is a penalty involved in rejecting offers, but.、Uh, Honestly, it comes down to personal choice. We can't force people to accept an offer. Let's take a break of 15 minutes. We'll come back at 10:02. Okay.